Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel. I'm so very glad you've joined me this evening and I think you're really going to love tonight's story. You know that there are so many people who in North America vacate and just disappear from their property and the place becomes abandoned. Well, this is one of those stories where our listener called Tammy actually buys a place and she finds out what actually happened to the missing people on her property. She actually was able to resolve this mystery and I know you're going to enjoy the story. But before we start, I want to send my love to all my listeners around North America, Canada and all the rest of the world. And I just want to send my biggest regards and love to all my subscribers. You are exceptional. I, I just love you guys so very much. And thank you so much for all your continued support. It means the absolute world for me. And I just love the fact that you guys are so passionate about the hairy man. Isn't it wonderful that we have this in common? It's just something that intrigues us so much and it's just the most exciting thing. Anyway, let's get started. Dear Sarah, my name is Tammy and I'm originally from Colorado. But my Bigfoot encounter happened when I bought an abandoned home for myself in Kentucky in a heavily wooded area off a long dirt road. It was on about 40 acres of land that had now become a rambling, dense, overgrown thicket. The house was a circa 1840 farmhouse and was in dreadful state of disrepair and the whole place was falling apart and needed to be thoroughly renovated and restored. The family disappeared from this home in 1987 and had stopped paying their utility bills and taxes and they never changed their home address either after that through the US Postal Service. It was all very very strange but I dismissed all those revelations and never gave them a second thought because I was buying this house for next to nothing and I didn't want any negative thoughts about the previous residents to hijack my desire to buy the place. When I bought the house it came with all the previous owner's possessions that were still there. It was almost like they had left in a huge hurry and even their very really good quality cars were still leave, left on the property. The family photographs remained on the walls and showed pictures of a young mother and a father with one girl who looked about 10 years old in the photographs and a boy who looked as if he was 12. I packed the cardboard boxes which I placed all the family's possessions inside some that were good enough to be used again, which I gave to a charity, and other stuff that had to be thrown away because it was either too weathered or was so personal to the family and would have not been of interest to anyone else. It really felt so sad to say goodbye to someone's whole life and to their worldly possessions, so I decided to keep back a couple of family photos to remember them by. As I did this, I did fight back a few tears wondering why the family had suddenly vanished off the face of the earth, never to be seen or heard from again. I did stumble across a child's diary, which I put away with the photographs I was keeping, as well as a bunch of letters tied up in red ribbon. I thought they might be old love letters, and as a romantic at heart, I love reading stuff like that, even though I know it's really not my business. After I had cleared the house, I organised a team of workers to help me restore the place into pristine condition. I was able to keep some of the original panes of glass in the French windows and they were a lovely feature because they really do not make glass panes like that today. I was able to keep the original wooden banisters and the wooden floors. There were some pieces of furniture in the house like the stunning wooden antique beds and side tables that were from the year 1825 and I kept them because they were in remarkably beautiful condition and were stunning antiques. I also got the family fridge from 1925 restored so that it is now fully functional in my kitchen and is an added feature that all my guests comment on and admire. I painted the roof a lovely green colour and the walls were painted white in keeping with the style of the house. I managed to blend old and new together and the result was a newly revived 1840 farmhouse in remarkably good condition. I also got a highly skilled team of people to fix up the garden and remove some of the excess thicket and rambling overgrowth in the surrounding woods. When everything was finished, it was where I was ready to move in and I could hardly wait. The house looked beautiful against a backdrop of green rolling valleys and a stream that ran through the right-hand side of the land. I was thrilled to see an abundance of just natural wildlife, 
It was beautiful. My family, which included my husband Terry, my son Piers, and my daughter Jolene, all moved into the house about two weeks after the completion date. And when I moved into the place on that very first night, I knew that something wasn't right. I felt it in my gut, but I couldn't explain that feeling. Something felt very off, and even Pierce commented that something about the place was odd, and he couldn't figure out why. A week after moving into the house, I finally got a visit from the next door neighbor who called herself Dot. She welcomed me into my new home with a homemade chicken pie, which was a speciality of hers, and it really tasted delicious. It was what Dot told me that really made me very concerned. I gathered that she had known the original family very well, and she said that the week before they had vanished, she noticed the family was on edge about something, and she said they had put heavy bolts and double locks on all the doors, as if they were keeping something out. It seemed that they were living in fear by the way that they were behaving, and she noticed that the mother had suddenly lost a lot of weight over a very short period of time, which she believed was stress-related. When I came to visit them, she told me, they were all looking over their shoulders and they appeared very nervous. They would immediately lock the door if I came to visit them and bolt it behind them, something they had never done before when I dropped in to say hello. Another thing, she continued, is they never mentioned any desire to leave their property. And I know they never had financial problems because when I needed a loan, they just gave me the money and told me that they could afford to give it to me. They always bought expensive cuts of meat from the butcher. They bought quality cars and sent their children to expensive schools. After those revelations, the gnawing feeling in my gut got extremely bad. And I just knew something terrible had happened to the family on this property. I realized that all those deadbolts Dot had told me about must have been deliberately removed before the house by the sellers to avoid any awkward questions. I know if I had seen those deadbolts myself, I would have had second thoughts about purchasing the property. When I told my husband the story, he suggested that a manic relative may have given the family a hard time, which was why they left their home in a hurry. I was not convinced by that idea. I suddenly remembered the child's diary and I decided to look through it. I noticed comments like, Mummy is sad today because the thing came again. And then there was a picture of a lady frowning, done by the child. There were also pictures of this hairy looking creature looking through the window and a picture of her mother crying and it looked very odd. I didn't know what to make of it. I read all the letters tied up in a red ribbon and noticed that they were from New Zealand from a lady called Hannah. One comment in the letter from this lady got my attention. Have you spoken to the police about the problem? You never know, they may be able to help. And even if they do not believe you, in my experience, they need to investigate your claims anyway. If the whole family testifies to what is happening to you, why on earth would they doubt your story? All four of you should be credible witnesses. Fast forward a few weeks and I had finally settled into my home with my family and things were going exceedingly well for us. I had put my worries about the previous owners to one side until one morning we woke up to find all our 10 chickens had vanished and there was a pile of their feathers everywhere, including all 10 of their snapped heads that were lying all over the ground. I was shocked by these strange happenings and who had done this because they had killed and plucked my chickens at the same time but on my property of all things. I mean, who does that? I really thought that this was the actions of a madman and not an animal. Then the following night, my son came rushing into my bedroom and he was frozen with terror, saying that there was a face at the window looking at him with red eyes and pointing a finger at him, indicating for him to open the window latch. I was horrified by his revelations and didn't know what to think or make of them. The following night, my son insisted on sleeping with my husband and I because he was so terrified about the face he had seen at the window coming back. Suddenly, my daughter came running into my bedroom the following night and she also had seen the face appearing at the window and the face had also indicated to her to open the latch. So the same thing that happened to my son had been happening to her as well. Now I had two children refusing to sleep in their own beds at night because of the scary face that they saw with the red eyes. 
Three nights went by and my whole family was now sleeping in my bedroom. One night I was woken to the sound of something rifling through the dumpster and I decided to investigate. So I went into the kitchen because the outside light was motion, was motion activated and the dumpster was on the left hand side of the back door that faced the edge of the wooded valley. In the dim energy saving light, I got a glimpse of a huge bipedal creature that was so huge there was no way this thing was human, nor was it a bear. It had a strange bullet shaped head, long arms and red eyes. I watched this thing slam down the bin it had been rifling through and then it proceeded to run through the forest at a lightning speed. I could hardly believe what I had been seeing. Could this creature be the thing that the young child had drawn in her pictures and had caused the people in the house to flee? Suddenly the pieces seemed to fit together and I knew I needed to investigate those woods, but I wasn't going to tell my husband about my plans. The next day, armed with a hunting rifle, I entered the wooded area to see if I could find any signs of this thing, whatever it was. As I went through the wooded area, something did not feel right. I do not know much about woods, but I do know that the place was airily quiet when I entered it. I searched the woods and was about to give up as I could see no trace of the creature, and then some shafts of sunlight came through the trees and they seemed to highlight something white shining in an area of rambling thicket. I walked over to the spot and discovered a large creature's nest that I knew at once belonged to the creature I had seen the previous night. I could see a large yogurt tub that I had thrown out the previous day because it had passed its sell-by date and was full of yogurt, lying in the nest along with other animal bones. I now had evidence that this creature was living in our woods and as I continued looking through the stuff in the creature's nest, I came across a human skull, and I could hardly believe my eyes. I knew at once that the skull belonged to a family member that had vanished from the property. This dangerous creature, whatever it was, must have killed those people. I immediately raced through the forest as fast as I could, because I knew that if this creature saw me, I would end up as another skull in the nest and I rarely doubted that my high-calibre rifle would offer me much protection against this beast. If it was that easy, surely the father of the original property would have been able to kill the thing that had been hounding them for so long. To cut a long story short, the police were called, and then an army truck arrived at our home, and there was also a helicopter used in the whole operation. I could hear a massive shootout taking place and I saw these soldiers carrying this massive body bag and it took seven strong men to carry this thing out of the woods and lower it into the back of the army truck. I knew they had killed the creature. I also saw that they had recovered all the bones that the creature had in its nest and I'm sure some of them must have been the human bones of that family. A day or so later I received an official visit from a man in a black suit who was some kind of government official and he told me to keep my mouth quiet about what I had seen. When I asked what the creature was that killed the family, he told me it was a bear, which I know is an outright lie, because when I saw that creature, and my children saw it as well, they saw that humanoid face in the window, and it was definitely no bear. Anyway, after all this stuff transpired, our home became a dreamy place to live in again, and suddenly our wooded area has attracted even more abundant wildlife, which has been especially wonderful for my children to enjoy. It took several years before I knew that the monster that tormented us was indeed a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. Sometimes I used to think of this poor family and the last night of their lives. I did wonder if one of those kids could have opened the latch to let the thing in, even though the place was bolted up. Kids can sometimes naively do silly things unintentionally. I do hope your listeners enjoyed my story. You know, I, I find that story incredibly fascinating and I do wonder if some of the disappearing people are attributed to Bigfoots or other cryptid-like creatures. Who knows? Until next time, goodbye and good night.